Hello and welcome to The Point. I'm Marcel Weider. Today on the show, the candidates have been nominated. The ads have started to roll out. The federal campaign of 2015 is on. Federal Liberal candidate Arif Virani joins us to talk about how the Liberal campaign is kicking it into high gear. And Queen's Park has adjourned until September. Rob Ferguson from the Toronto Star talks about the highs and lows from this most recent session of the 41st Legislature. All that and more on this edition of The Point. Candidates are knocking on doors across the city in anticipation of the upcoming federal election. It promises to be a bruising race of endurance. Polls show that all three parties are pretty well tied. Arif Varani is the Liberal candidate in the riding of Parkdale High Park. Arif, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Marcel. I'm glad to be here. So the campaign, although not officially on, is actually on. We've already seen the campaign ads starting to roll out. The various uh, tours are going on. What's happening in Parkdale High Park? There's a lot happening in Parkdale High Park, to be honest. It's, uh, we've been sort of at the doors and engaging with voters since back in February, actually. So we're certainly not waiting for a writ to drop to be active. I think it's important that people know that there's an election coming up. It's a very important election. People are geared up to vote this time. The riding itself votes a little bit higher than the norm, which I find great because people are quite engaged. But we've opened a campaign office. We've hosted events. We had a roundtable immigration discussion on uh, uh, dealing with uh, John McCallum, where John McCallum came and visited us. So it was terrific in terms of some of the outreach we've been doing. We're having a Kennedy picnic coming up uh, on, on July 1st. So things are rolling in Park Daily Park, and it's, it's good to see because the, I think the residents appreciate it. Now, we, we saw in the recent provincial election that the NDP candidate, Cherry DeNovo, just barely held on in, in that campaign. Does that give you any boost or confidence that things might change federally? I'm glad you're aware of that because I, I'm often communicating that to, at the doors, that, that riding, the riding was decided by 525 votes in the provincial election last year. That translates to over 300 polls, 1.7 votes per poll. So that means Marcel and his spouse stay home one night. Well, that's the two votes in that poll that could have swung mm-hmm. the, the riding. Because I think it's important because to the extent you do encounter cynicism from the voters, I emphasize that every vote counts, and here's the proof. The proof positive is that it was two votes per poll in the, in the very last election. And people start to think, okay, well, I'm going to make sure I do vote, and if I'm not going to be here, I'm going to vote at the advanced polls, etc. But that demonstrates the, the malleability of the electorate in Park Daylight Park, and I think that's a good thing for democracy, and it's a good thing for you know, the Liberal Party's fortunes going forward. So talking about your riding, it's a very interesting riding that you have. You have some very uh, areas of low income, and you have some areas of very high income, yeah. and you, you straddle everything in between there. Yeah. How are you able to bridge those different divides? You're right. It's a, it's a classic sort of microcosm of sort of an urban center anywhere in this country. But uh, in terms of me personally, I am not, I'm not a person who came from a lot of means. I am a refugee from Uganda who came here as part of the Idi Amin exodus in 1972. Mm-hmm. When I speak about that experience to a newcomer who's Tibetan or Roma in Parkdale, mm-hmm. that resonates with them because they understand that this is a person who not only sympathizes with their situation but can empathize with it. So we lived, our first port of call was the YMCA in downtown Montreal. Right? We were given clothes for the Quebec winter. So my parents have these romanticized memories of it, but it was a very difficult time. But what I like about sort of that, that sort of model is that what happened is, is that you know, my parents found work. They were benefited by the settlement programs that used to be plentiful. They got their kids in public school. And lo and behold, my sister and I both ended up at McGill on scholarships with part-time jobs. And we got, I got through McGill. Then I went to U of T's law school. And that to me is sort of, it sounds a bit cliche, but that sort of narrative is supposed to be what this country is all about, providing those kinds of opportunities. What I find most uh, disheartening is that when I speak to those folks in Parkdale, they're not seeing those kinds of aspirations for their children. What they're seeing is very visceral challenges. How do I get my son through school and on the right side of the law, as opposed to how do I get my son or my daughter potentially aspiring for public office? And that to me is the deficit of national aspirations that we need to remedy by changing the government. How would a, a liberal government tackle these types of issues? We, we've, we've only heard a limited amount from Justin Trudeau in terms of how he's going to tackle, he's talked about fairness, about the middle class, mm-hmm. 
but not much more. It's mm -hmm. partly just rendering fairness within the immigration system. So it's the due process within that system. It's things like, on a very micro level, it's things like, if you recollect, the cuts to medical care for refugee applicants, mm -hmm. which was perceived to be heavy-handed by most uh, observers. It was actually struck down by the courts as a Section 12 violation of the Charter, uh, a decision which was since appealed by Stephen Harper. But it's efforts to reach out to those communities to demonstrate that the party, that the, the government, via the Liberal Party, is welcoming of those individuals, welcoming of their contributions. Mm -hmm. It's trying to do right by people who are foreign trained professionals who are finding difficulties in terms of their accreditation process. But the Liberal Party is keen on ensuring that we are both open to newcomers but also doing right by them once they arrive. And a very, cl a very tangible case in point is the response to what's going on in the Middle East in terms of Syria and Iraq. The Liberal Party took a strong stand to say, no, we are not going in and expanding that mission into Syria. What we should be doing in Syria is doing what we did for the, for the Ugandan Asians 42 years ago when a guy mm -hmm. like Arif showed up, which is that we we're opening the doors. So the Liberal Party wants to bring in 25,000 Syrian uh, refugee applicants immediately, indiscriminate of their religion, which I find the most specious component of what's going mm. on right now is that the government currently is cherry picking who can come in based on certain religious minorities that t happen not all not to be Muslim, which you know you can read into that what you want, but to me it's pretty clear what sort of dynamic is being at, is at play. One of the knocks against the current conservative government is that when it comes to human rights, they turn a blind eye. It's quite alarming, uh, to be honest. To, to my mind, the the sort of the standard that Canada upholds is a standard that is internationally recognized. It goes back to our involvement in drafting the UN Charter, which I, if I recollect correctly, was drafted by an old McGill law prof. Mm -hmm. uh, and that tradition was a strong tradition and always been a strong tradition. What you find right now in terms of Canada and its work abroad is that we are being internationally isolated as opposed to internationally welcomed. We are being labeled as a, a polarizing nation that is not engaging with other nations. And our human rights record has fallen woefully behind. And I think the case in point is that you know, these trade missions and these business practices, they're not, they weren't invented by Stephen Harper and the Conservative Party. Sort of the Team Canada missions were sort of a mm -hmm. Chrétien phenomenon. But what I always appreciated was that Jean Chrétien would lead those missions and then establish relations over a, you know, a power deal with China, but it would be used as a beachhead in order to engage with the Chinese government or Chinese officials on their civil liberties policies or their human rights policies. That has entirely fallen by the wayside and that's to the detriment of both the people in those countries but also to Canada's stature. On the human rights mm -hmm. front, I mean, the list is, is long in terms of some of the egregious violations we have. I mean, a case in point is again this past week, the response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in terms of trying to do right by the historic legacy in this country vis-a-vis -vis Aboriginal people and the Stephen Harper was you know, conspicuously silent, as opposed to, I, you know, I was quite proud with Justin Trudeau's stand that it wasn't looking at some of those recommendations. It was all 95 of those recommendations need to be implemented. You're facing Tom Mulcair and the NDP, Peggy Nash, mm -hmm. and they just came off a stunning win in Alberta where the orange uh, wave uh, took Rachel Notley into the Premier's office. How big an impact is that going to have and how are you dealing with your NDP counterpart? So that's an interesting question, and uh, I'll confess to you it's come up at the door, but I, I, again, I, I usually have a discussion with people when, it, when uh, people ask me, you know, Arif, what do you think about that Alberta result? And for people who followed it, I presume you would have followed it as a journalist, and I was following it as a candidate, obviously, but that election actually had very little, if anything, to do with the federal NDP. You may or may not be aware mm -hmm. that Rachel Notley actively distanced herself from Tom Mulcair. He was not permitted in Alberta, he, largely because the individual himself is not a particularly popular figure because of his energy policy stands in Alberta. So what that was was an anti-Jim Jim Prentice vote, an anti-conservative vote, and they turned mm -hmm. to per a person who they thought was a plausible alternative. I'm very happy and very enthused that people are turning away from the conservative message, even in the conservative's backyard. That's an encouraging sign. I think it's fantastic for democracy that you can have that kind mm -hmm. of renewal, but I don't see it as a threat in terms of a national NDP bulwark, and I think people who analyze it see it exactly for that, that is not a, a, a portent of things to come nationally. What are the key issues that you knock at the door talking to people about? So it is. Uh, it relates to the economy, as I mentioned earlier on. It also relates to the environment. That is a very strong issue in my riding. The riding is bordered by three train tracks and Lake Ontario. Sorry, a river and three train tracks. Mm -hmm. One train track runs right alongside Lake Ontario. There's a strong concern about rail safety and about transportation regulation, a matter of classic federal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. The Lac Megantic train ran right through my riding before mm -hmm. it ended up in Lac Megantic and turned into a ball of fire consuming nearly 50 lives. Wow. There is an issue that needs to be addressed 
immediately in terms of the safety of those rail cars, in terms of the flammability of the contents, in terms of the frequency by which they are passing through various communities. And it's not just Toronto, it's n in numerous communities mm -hmm. throughout this country. And again, what you find is that there are uh, a few sort of gestures that are made in that regard by uh, people like uh, Minister Raitt or the American Transportation Secretary. But one of the most recent rollouts was the idea to move towards a more sturdy type of rail car that is less subject to an accident, less penetrable. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the target for that was 10 years from now. And that to me is, again, just ignoring the fact that yes, we need to move in that direction, but then movements need to be done now, not going forward sort of a decade from now or in the context of the greenhouse gas emissions 85 years from now. So that's a fundamental difference where the Liberals and the Conservatives would divide, but the environment is a strong, strong and important issue in my riding. Arif, thank you very much for joining us. Up next, Rob Ferguson from the Toronto Star joins us to wrap up the latest session of the Ontario Legislature.